The other day we took a look at a set of hinges for a tool chest, specifically a Dutch style tool chest. And there's some links in those videos if you want to go back and see what a Dutch style tool chest is. But the set of hinges I need to send out to the customer also includes a hasp. And the hasp shares that key characteristic of the hinges in that one piece will be viewed from the outside of the chest and one will be viewed from the inside. So one half is kind of installed upside down. That'll make more sense as we go along today. To make this hasp, it's really fairly simple and there's a lot of characteristics that are the same as any other hasp. You can change the design, you can do all sorts of things with it and make it a very unique project. But for this hasp, I'm going to use the little scrap piece that we cut out when we cut the two hinge straps. We had a little bit left over. And this is a little bit over an inch and a half long, so that's something like 38, 39 millimeters long, something like that. And again, it's eighth inch material or three millimeter thick material. The part of the hasp that pivots and moves and engages the, the staple on the hasp is also made out of that one inch wide material or 25 millimeter wide material. And the other piece that sort of mirrors the hinges, but it's a little bit wider. This is just the style that I came up with when I first designed this set of hinges. Nothing special about it. Nothing requires that it be this shape or this design or anything else. But this is what I use. And this is inch and a half or about 37 millimeters wide. Again, eighth inch or three millimeter thick. None of those measurements really matter. Make the hasp suit your project. You don't need to duplicate what I'm doing. For that matter, this is sort of that proprietary design that just goes with the Dutch tool chests. Chances are your hasp will need to have different design features. The first thing I want to do with the wide bar that I have is trim it down a little bit. I want, I want a one inch tail. It's a few inches long, maybe three inches long. Again, I don't worry about it too much. I don't get much hung up on that. And that'll get forged just like the end of the hinges did. And then the wider section is where the joint will be. And to do that, I just draw some lines by eye. I just use my finger kind of as a little fence with my silver pencil and draw a line that I think is about an inch apart here. If it's not quite right, that's okay. And you can forge this instead of cutting it. But I have found that in inch and a half material that's only eighth inch thick, this really wants to fold over and it's a lot of work. I'm going to cut it on a bandsaw. You could chisel cut it, you could hacksaw it, you could grind it. Chisel cutting would be more traditional, but since this is kind of a production item and this is going to get completely forged and change shape entirely before I'm done with this section, I don't mind bandsawing it because none of that will show. Then I do the sim similar thing to the narrow strap because it's going to get a little tongue on it and it's easier to go ahead and rough that out than it is to try and forge a one inch strap down to something that's about 3 16 of an inch wide. I'm going to go ahead and start with the long strap. It really doesn't matter which piece you start with. And then we're going to use a guillotine tool to isolate the mass for the bean finial just like we did with the hinges. This is just like we did with the hinges, only this step is kind of in our way, so I'm going to go to the hardy hole to find a narrower place to work across. And create a nice little taper from here out. And this is the fixed piece. The other piece is what pivots and engages the staple. This piece is what mounts to the inside of the lid. So next I'm going to go ahead and put a bevel on here just like we did with the hinge straps. Clean that up just a little bit first. Then we'll do the finial. And again that's good side down and half face blows at the edge of the anvil. 
I start with a cross peen, and I work to one side, then I work to the other side, then I change to the face, and I clean all that up. You'll notice that this is not straight with the anvil when I do this, and that isn't because that's a recommended technique. It's because my anvil actually has a crown in it here, and if I come level here, I don't actually get a step because it's up over the edge where this starts to drop off. And that's a result of this having been repaired with welding at one point that seems to have softened it, and both sides of my anvil now drop off. It needs to be redressed, or maybe I'll just get a new anvil one of these days. So that's really all there is to that for now. I'll let it cool, then we'll cut it off, and we'll roll up the eye for the joint. So the next thing we want to do is the piece that will make the hasp. This is the part that actually pivots and needs a slot in it. We've already roughed out the tongue here on the bandsaw. We'll do some forging on that. But first I want to go ahead and punch the slot. Well naturally I forgot to turn the camera on as I punched this hole. So let me cool this end off. We'll turn it around and we'll just punch the hole on this side. Then we'll come back and finish this end. Now I have a punch that is smaller than what I need. This is nowhere near a big enough slot to get this through, but my drift is very close to my final size. The actual final shaping will be done with a file. And ideally, you should have a bolster to punch through. Trying to punch through over the, the hardy hole, we will just push this thin material down in there. It'll be really a mess. If you don't have a bolster, you can set your vise to this width and use the vise jaws as a bolster. You want to center side to side at an appropriate distance from the end, depending on what your end is going to look like in the long run. And because I've got a bolster, now I should be able to finish this as it cools off and shear the slug out instead of squishing the slug out. Well, I've got to line it up with the hole in the, the bolster, and that works pretty well. And that slug didn't quite break off, so we'll get it hot and try one more time. Looks like one side of my bolster has a sharper edge than the other side, so that's... A, Side, I'm going to put the part that steer needs to shear. Let's see if we nope, still didn't want to shear, but you can usually break that off if it doesn't shear off. Of course, the first one I did punched out beautifully, but that's all the punch out we're going to end up with here. You don't punch much out, you don't lose much when you, you hot punch a hole. Next thing we want to do is drift the hole. Now the drift does not go through the bolster very, very well, so I'm not going to use the bolster with the drift. Now while it is possible to drift this over the hardy hole, you need to move from side to side and it kind of sucks down in there as you, you drive the drift in, and it's less than ideal. So a bolster the size of the drift would be nice. As I said, you can also just set the vise to the right width and use it as your bolster. Now this drift is just mild steel, which is why it's so mushroomed out. But that's okay. And that's all there really is to doing a hole. And that probably doesn't quite fit our staple, so that all this rough, ragged stuff there will be able to file out and make it fit. So back to our original piece here, but still at the vise. I'm going to use the punch to just open that hole up just a little bit. That makes it easier to get the drift in, and because that puckers out and comes drops down from one side, when I come back with the drift, I come from the opposite side. Makes a pretty good looking slot there. 
Now I just clean this up and flatten it. Then I round up the little tongue here. That'll get scrolled eventually, but I'm going to save that for one of the very last steps. And I like the way punching swells this out. It gives it more character. I have an advantage of a punched hole over a machined hole. I'd like a little sharper point on this, so I'll draw it out square, get the point, go back to octagon, and then round it up again. And this is going to cool and we'll cut it off. So while those cool, let's make our little staple. I just start bending this at the anvil. And then I clean it up over a bending fork that's just the right size. I don't actually bend it in the fork because it's too small for this material, but it gives me everything I need to make a nice little staple that fits our hasp. Then I take the little plate that will hold the staple and I just forge a bevel around the edges of it. We know it takes about an inch and a half material to make the eye for the hinges, so it'll be the same for the hasp. So we need to leave at least that much, but I also like to put a couple of screws in here, so I'm going to leave about an inch and a half from that point. So I'm going to cut that one off right about there. Now the, back, the back plate for the staple here We'll come up to about here. I forge a little offset in that so that it's, everything stays in line nicely. So we need to be about an inch and a half from this point. And I'm not giving you exact measurements here because exact measurements aren't that important. Now if you cut these with a hacksaw, you can cut the bevel in that you need to roll the eye while you cut. And that makes life a little easier in the long run. Assuming you can cut a straight line, some days I can, and today I can't. Let me move over a little bit. Not bad. For this piece, there is no front and back yet, so it really doesn't matter which side you put the bevel on. And if these aren't square, like that one is not square, go ahead and file it and grind it, whatever you got to do. Now rolling up the eye on this is just like it was with the other pieces for the hinges. I try to do it as much as possible by eye here. The, the drift in it. That was a little bit wonky, so definitely going to need the drift. But with the drift pin in, we can correct a lot of little lumps and bumps. Move around the anvil however you need to. And of course, if you're desperate, a tool like this can help, but not worth making if you're just making one set of hinges and one hasp. Probably not worth making if you're just making a couple of dozen sets of hinges. That tool takes most of a day to make. Next thing I want to do is I want to put an offset in here. 
so that this can sit over the top of this back plate that the staple goes on. So that one side has to sit on that and the other side has to go flat. Not absolutely vital, this could stand up in the air, I just think it makes it look a little bit better. And this is just a really simple thing to do under the fly press. The only thing that makes this difficult is trying not to bump into the camera while you're doing it. I just put it on top of a piece of eighth inch bar and make sure that I'm not going to squish my knuckle. And I put another piece of eighth inch bar on top of it here. And I could make a jig that just does this all the time, but this is something I can use for other purposes and I don't have to have a one size jig. This is kind of multi-purpose this way. That gives us our offset. Then I want to scroll up the little end here. I take a fairly tight scroll. This is just something to grab with your fingers when you open and close the hasp. Just something like that. That's that piece. Then we're going to roll up the wide one. And this rolls towards the back of the strap, just like the one piece on the hinges did, because this is the will mount under the lid of the chest on the inside. When you do a wider hinge, sometimes this won't behave and it starts to bow. You can back bend it first and anticipate that, or you can just keep on top of it and keep working it back straight as you work it. And the wider the strap gets, the more that becomes a problem. So if you're doing big two or three inch, four inch wide hinges, you'll have to deal with that a lot more. But if you just pay attention to it, you can usually get these rolled up pretty accurately. Clean that up around the pin as you need to. That one looks pretty good. Now my drift pin, the, the outgoing taper isn't quite this long, so it usually doesn't go all the way through and fall out. Now it is time for the inevitable bench work. Hacksaws, files, bandsaws, grinders, whatever it is you want to use, we need to assemble these into a working hasp. And I'm going to start by laying out the hole placement in the plate that holds the staple because these are cold. I've just got a square set to a half inch. I'm going to mark from both sides anyways just in case it's off and I see a little double line there so I know that I'm going to need to actually drill between the double line. Then I will use my staple and mark the center of the staple or keeper or whatever you want to call it. And I will need to drill holes that are exactly this size there. And I will also center punch so I can drill four holes for my number eight flathead wood screws in the four corners. If you're making a batch of things like this and you're going to do a whole bunch of them over and over again, it pays to make a little template. And I do have a template for this. I just thought I would show it without using the template. And the template is nothing more than one of these that I just have never assembled. Made sure to get it as perfect as I could. And then I can use it to mark any more of them I want to. But for just one, there's nothing wrong with doing it this way. Just make sure that when you're countersinking these holes, your countersink won't be so big that it interferes with this hole or keeps you from being able to put the screw in that hole. So all this needs to be big enough to allow for all the pieces. So only the two for the staple, get the quarter inch hole drilled, and 
And the other holes get drilled for whatever size screw you're going to use. In my case, it's a 3 16 hole. And these are very close to the corner, so make sure you're not so close that your screw head's going to hang over the side of the plate when you finish this. A lot of stuff happening in a small space. The holes for the screws are countersunk on the front side of the plate. Just big enough for the screw head to sit flush. And these holes get countersunk from the back because I'm going to plug weld that staple in, just like that. And if you're lucky, the staple goes right in those holes, which it almost never does. But it's real easy to just squeeze it a little bit in the vise. At least for me, they always seem to be just a hair wide. But once it's close to lining up, you should be able to tap it in there. Make sure it's not leaning over. This one's leaning a little bit. That's better. And then I just plug the weld this using the torch. You can TIG weld it, MIG weld it. You can peen these over if you want to, but I have real trouble with them staying put. I always end up driving them out before that happens. A vise with better jaws might work, but my vices are pretty worn and smooth. But I also feel like the plug weld is a little bit more secure in this situation. Now if you leave enough of the staple sticking out the back and you're using a oxyacetylene torch or a TIG torch, that's all the filler rod you need. You don't need to add anything. I come back and I grind that off flush so it'll sit flat on the chest and that part is done. Now at this stage of the game, these are pretty much just like the, the hinges were the other day. File the flats and make sure the little finial is shaped the way you want it. Now because of this little step here, sometimes a square file gets in and does that part very nicely. It helps to have an assortment of files. case this really doesn't need anything that's a because there's so little forging here I don't need to worry about edge filing this piece of the hasp we will put a little light bevel on it and I'll talk about that when we get there but we do need to make sure that our staple will fit through this slot for that I tend to use chainsaw files Try and find one that just barely fits. You keep an eye on it and make sure you're filing centered. If your punch was off, this is your chance to correct a little bit of misalignment. And it just almost fits. It needs to be a little bit longer. That fits nicely. Now we can go to the filing vise and clean up this bevel on the long edge. Make sure you address the finial while you're here. Now 
fence, pretty much all of that. And I put the same two little decorative grooves on here that we put on the other pieces. Just realized I was showing this to a position the camera wasn't in because the camera was over there. Sorry about that. And again, you could chisel these, but you can also file them. And I do leave my file in contact with the material on the back stroke, but I'm not pushing, I'm not trying to cut. It just helps keep me from having to reposition it in that groove every time, which leads to mistakes. I'd rather buy another $12 file a little bit sooner than ruin a $100 half. And I've still been using this file for this purpose for over a year, so it's not a big deal. So that's our decorative groove. Now because this piece moves, I don't just file a bevel on one side, it's going to be seen and touched from both sides, so I file a real light bevel just enough to ease the edge and make it comfortable for people to touch on both sides. So that's real quick to do. And it's mostly just so it's not sharp or uncomfortable. And I do see a little bit of a burr on the back of this slot where I was filing because we were pushing to that direction. So I'm just going to clean that up a little bit. That's much better. Now this is another hasp I'm working on, not the one we've been watching progress here. Because this piece is so much wider than this, I don't need to take as much out of this as I did for the hinges. So I just take a little bit, about an eighth of an inch, and I usually just do that by eye. Then I line this piece up and cut it. And when we get it all done, this needs to go to about 90 degrees here so that it will fit the front of the chest. Now the Dutch tool chests are usually about 30 degrees, so that's not a big deal. But if I go 90, it would fit any, just about any kind of a chest. This one's not quite there, so I'll do a little bit more filing on it before we're done. But let's go ahead and start cutting the joint on the one we've been working on. So I'll start with this piece. This is kind of backwards from what I did the other day. And I'm just going to take a little bit off the side. And yes, I usually do this under the bandsaw, but we saw that the other day. So today we're going to use a hacksaw. Just want to cut till you're through the eye. And I'll make a horizontal cut here. Try to take the same amount off the other side. If you can't cut a straight line with a hacksaw, practice on something else first. Then clean the cuts up with a file. Try to get everything square and symmetrical, parallel sides, straight across these cuts.
And then we'll go ahead and mark this piece. And I mark my line just to the outside of where I've already cut. And then when I cut with the hacksaw, I try to leave that line and that should make this pretty much an exact fit. And here we're just going to cut through the knuckle, but we have to chisel the center section out. that same straight-sided cold chisel and just create a nice score mark here that I'll break off in the vise instead of cutting all the way through the anvil. You just grab that with a pair of vise grips and Snap it off, see if this fits. Just barely, it kind of drags, and that's what I want. That way I can clean this up. That fits much better. Test fit this. It still rubs a little bit. So figure out where it's holding up. And I think it's actually this piece here. And do whatever it takes to make it work right. That's much better, and that goes all the way to 90 degrees, so I'm happy with that. Yep, I think that's going to be just fine. Let's put the pin in. We'll take the temporary pin out, put the permanent pin in. Again, this is a good chance to check it, make sure it works. It's stiff, but that will loosen up when I heat it and adjust it, so I think we're okay. Now probably it won't move at all at this point. It moves a little. That's pretty good. Frequently that peening the pin sets these things up really tight. But we can heat it and it'll run just fine. So just like when we were doing the hinges, I want to make sure everything operates smoothly. It takes a little back and forth sometimes. Now that I've got that closed up, I can heat just the joint, that'll be easier to manipulate. So with that good and hot, that's real easy to go ahead and open all the way here. What you don't want to do is force this, because you might start to unwrap your eye for the joint, and that's really hard to fix if you do that, almost impossible sometimes. So go very easy, very careful. But once it starts to move easily, that's usually done. And I wire brush it.
I'm going to heat that back up and I put just the bear paw part of my touch mark on this. The hinges have my name and the bear paw, but since this is so much smaller, I just put a little bear paw right there on this flat part of the hasp. It just goes right there. And check the other side for straightness, any bows or twists or anything like that. I just realized we forgot to drill holes in these. How come somebody didn't mention that? So I'm going to have to go ahead and drill holes and then we'll have to heat this side up again just to color the edges of the, the countersunk holes. Alright, I went back and I drilled four holes for number eight slotted flathead wood screws. Same thing we put on the, the hinges. And now we'll just let this cool till it's just hot enough to, you guessed it, put some paste wax on. Well, here is our hasp. And this goes on the chest in this orientation, and the knuckle has to be inlet into the wood on the lid of the chest to be installed this way. You can certainly make hasps that install differently. This longer strap can be turned around so that the show side is on the outside of the chest and then the knuckle isn't a big deal. It all just depends on the project that's going to be installed on. Again, this, this hasp is specific to the Dutch tool chest design, but so much of this can be interpreted and changed and used for any hasp, whether it's a door or another kind of box. All sorts of things that you might need a hasp on to secure something. You can put a little padlock on there, make them bigger, make them smaller. Lots of options here. It's just the way that this is designed to install that makes it specific. But all of the components can be rearranged, redesigned, reworked, resized. Use your imagination. Now the customer order that I'm working on these things for still has one more piece and that's some chest handles on a rectangular back plate. We looked at making some heart shaped chest handles the other day. So we'll look at what makes these a little bit different. They're actually a little bit simpler to make. So we'll make a set of those maybe in a day or two. Then we'll have this order ready to ship out and you'll have some ideas to make a full set of chest hardware for your own project. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't done so already, I would love it if you hit that subscribe button. Take some time, watch a few of the other videos, share the videos with your friends, but then make some time in your day to get out to your shop, make something, but stay safe, wear your safety glasses. We'll see you for the next one. If you would like to provide financial support for the videos here at Black Bear Forge, there are links in the video description for PayPal and Patreon. Those are merely donations. The content is free and will remain free.